Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our economic impact of digital manufacturing ecosystems webinar. Uh, my name is Joanne Moretti and I am the CEO of JCurve Digital and also the acting or interim chief marketing officer here at Fictive. So I'm uh, playing a dual role, but uh, very excited to uh, be with you. Um, join, uh, you know, we really want you to join in the discussion. We want this to be very interactive. Uh, we encourage questions and participation throughout this, uh, this session. We want your ideas, we want your thoughts. We're gonna be presenting uh, maybe some things that are uh, slightly different or new concepts for you. So we'll try to give you as much context as possible and really set the stage. Uh, and at the same time, try not to make it too boring for, for those of you that really are familiar with uh, the uh, digital manufacturing ecosystem platforms that we're gonna talk about. Um, either way, you know, if you're new to it or not, we really do want you to ask us questions if you have any and make this a conversation. Um, while we're waiting for people to trickle in, just uh, maybe, you know, just in introduce yourself in the chat room and if, you, if you're comfortable with that and what company uh, you're with. And also, if you just want to just share uh, what your ideas and thoughts are in terms of uh, your key takeaways for this session and, and what you'd like to, uh, to gain from it. All right. Let's just see. Take a look at that chat room. Hi, welcome, William, Darren. Thank you for joining. All right, so key takeaways. Let's talk about that for a second and, and what we hope to give you from this session. Um, we know that there are just uh, millions of dollars being spent right now. We've actually been doing uh, some surveys uh, here at Fictive with a company called Dimensional Research and uh, we've come to learn that there's just uh, millions of dollars being spent in uh, digital transformation of all, all sorts, right? And integrating uh, complex digital systems into your environment um, and really, uh, you know, trying to mitigate risk, uh, you know, in supply chains and building supply chain resiliency, uh, digitizing the factory floor to give you more agility, more speed, less errors, uh, less defects, uh, more on-time deliveries, um, digitizing the entire, you know, product life cycle from end to end, right? Um, and creating some less friction in the product development life cycle and the new product introduction cycle so that you can get to market faster. So we're seeing, you know, companies uh, investing millions. And some of them aren't having very much luck because it's not that simple. We've got all the tools, we've got the cloud, we've got AI, we've got you know, 5G bandwidth, we've got everything we need to help us really drive digital transformation, but it's not easy. And we don't always have all the resources that we need to do it because there are so many things involved. So what we hope to give you today as a key takeaway is that there's actually an alternative to turning your world upside down and, and trying to digitize all these processes and spending all this money. Uh, and we want to give you a glimpse of this alternative. Um, and the alternative is uh, digital manufacturing ecosystems and what they involve and how you can leverage them to give you some of the same benefits that digital transformation gives you. So with that as the sort of key takeaways that we want to leave uh, this session or, or leave in your mind uh, as you leave this session, I want to take a moment and introduce our panel. And we've got with us today uh, Nate Evans, the co-founder and chief experience officer here at Fictive. Nate, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you give your, yourself a little introduction and just uh, share with the audience. Sure. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Uh, namely, we're, uh, we have some special partners here, both uh, AWS, as well as one of our marquee customers, Heavy Robotics, that's also doing some amazing work. Um, as Joanne mentioned, we've seen a lot of challenges with our customers, and we've seen a lot of benefits we've been able to help them with. Um, and so we're really looking forward to this conversation on unpacking it. Uh, background context for myself, uh, Dave and I started the company seven years ago. We're brothers co-founders and we're tackling a pretty 
uh, exciting opportunity in our mind. Uh, my background is really on the product and the finance side. So prior to founding Fictive, I was um, a financial advisor in the investment banking world, um, doing sell side mergers and acquisitions, as well as capital fundraising for technology companies. So very familiar with the life cycle of technology companies, and I'm hoping to chime in and help quantify really the impact of you know what we're seeing in the market. And I'd love to field any questions on you know uh, secular trends, on uh, finance, on the product experience. Um, so looking forward to chatting with you all today. Thank you, Nate. That's perfect. Yeah, you'll give us that finance view of things and help us quantify in uh, in terms of the business case. So Preet, Preet comes to us from AWS. Why don't you give us a little background? Uh, I think this is a beautiful blend of finance and, and uh, you know, technology prowess. And then with Dave on the uh, mechanical engineering side, but Preet, tell us about your background. Sure, Jan. Yeah, uh, so I'm Preet Work. I'm a partner solutions architect and in working at AWS, I work with uh, partners like Fictive in, uh, and focus on um, industrial software segment. So I work uh, with the partners for, uh, you know, the, doing the technical enablement uh, and uh, helping them adopt uh, uh, cloud best practices for their uh, digital transformation journey. Uh, so basically, you know, I work uh, uh, with partners and help them build uh, scalable and re resilient solutions on AWS. And uh, we're gonna talk more about uh, what uh, we've been able to do with Effective in this uh, webinar. And yeah, so, Joanne, you, uh, introduce Dave. Yes, Dave Rollinson. So first of all, Dave, thank you so much for being such a valued client for us and taking your time uh, with us today. Tell us about yourself and tell us about Heavy and I'll, I'll shift into the Heavy slide as you're doing that. Uh, sure, yeah, so, uh... I'm one of the, the five co-founders of Heavy. We're a company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, that spun out of Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, our product is essentially an agile development platform for robotics. Um, there's a, a software component to it uh, that helps people manage kind of the motion control layer, anything related to measuring, controlling motion or measuring motion of a, of a robotic system. Uh, and there's a hardware component. Uh, we make uh, actuators. So things that are integrated together that you just give power ethernet and the idea is you want to create something that's as easy to develop as Lego. Uh, we want to make robotics where they're, they're a smart tool, right? Rather than just kind of some mystical machine, they're, they're just the next generation of tools that people use to augment and amplify their, their creativity. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, responsible for, for pretty much everything on the mechanical side of, of development from development through, through production. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, very unique, very demanding needs. We're a, we're a small, tight team of, of 12 people uh, total. Um, and Fictive is kind of a, a core part of us being able to execute on that and respond to the market. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, that context. So I'm going to just uh, jump to uh, some findings that we had and just share with you some of the uh, some of the findings that we uh, came across in our survey this year. Uh, and we published those findings, by the way, in something we call the State of Manufacturing, uh, 2020 State of Manufacturing. So if you wanna dig deeper into those, those are on our website. But it's pretty incredible what we found, uh, very compelling results. We found that 87% of executives have a high priority uh, digital transformation initiative, or it is the top priority. Uh, of their world right now. That's a big number. And if you think about the $13 trillion uh, manufacturing industry overall in that market, 87% of a $13 trillion market that's doing digital transformation is really looking at you know, ways to, to improve their business uh, with these large investments that are going on. And we found that there's three major drivers in terms of that 87% in terms of what's driving them to do this, uh, so many people to do this. And the, 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 the three are business performance, so some type of improvement in the way they're running their business, whether it's to reduce costs, improve transparency, uh, create more agility for their business, uh, build out more supply chain resilience, um, and then accelerate uh, time to market. So 
if it has to do with any of those things, we kind of bucketed that into uh, business performance as sort of a key driver of that, that, uh, that number. And then we've highlighted sort of COVID related um, uh, drivers because we are finding that those are driving uh, the push to, digital, to digitally transform even faster. Um, and then improve experiences. That's the, the second key driver that we're seeing, right? And it's not just experiences in dealing with your customers and, and having a different sort of experience with them there through digital means. It's really also, again, being driven by this whole work from home new normal and how do we continue the collaboration when we're not in the same room, making these designs, refining, iterating, failing and, and, and you know, going back at it type of thing. So how do you manage that whole new product uh, development cycle when you're apart, right? And digital seems to be the answer to that. Um, and then the third key bullet and the thing that really has a lot of people thinking here around digital transformation, especially business leaders, is that um, we really, okay, co-host just stopped my video. Was something, something technical going on or? Just the video was fritzing in and out, kind of flickering for some reason, Joanne, but. Okay, I don't need video. <laughs> I'll yeah. keep talking. Okay, and so then the third uh, reason, as I was going on to say, is that um, there's really a whole new appetite for growth, right? And that digital transformation can drive new and accretive growth uh, through new business models that can be uh, brought to market using digital. Um, and so shifting maybe from a lower value, strictly just a hardware product to a higher value, you know, hardware, software services model uh, is the other key driver that we're seeing. So I'm going to take a moment now and, um, and well, I'm going to tell you that of that 87%, only 14% of those companies that responded that they have a digital initiative or a transformation underway have said that they have a well-funded digital transformation plan, only 14%. So the path to digital seems like, yeah, we need to go there. We have drivers, we have needs, we want to do this. There's benefits, there's definitely clear benefits. The problem is that they don't have the mind share, they don't have the resources, or there's other obstacles like legacy systems or whatever it is there's things grinding it down or grinding it to a halt, right? And if you're in IT and you're on this call, you know what I mean. Your budget keeps getting cut every single year, right? So if you're in IT going, what, what are the alternatives? What are the alternatives? Um, I think we, we've probably got one or two things up our sleeve for you. But let's take a poll real quick. Let me, let me understand um, what are some of the things or obstacles, if you are uh, one of those 87% that's, that's driving towards digital transformation, what are some of the things that are holding you back? So let's just take a moment and use the chat box again. And let's try uh, putting some thoughts on, you know, what, what's kind of standing in your way. Yeah, it'd be great to hear. Definitely looking forward to what the poll holds. Uh, I'm pretty interested in the results. At the same time, you know, additional qualitative color, uh, color, if there are other buckets and challenges you're struggling, you know, a big part of why we host these types of webinars is to bring the community and like-minded people together. So please feel free to chat um, and share any additional context or other problem statements. We'd love to uh, respond and uh, view those responses as well. All right. Are the results in? Wow. Wow. We are overwhelmed by the possibilities and don't have a clearly defined scope of work. Very interesting. Expertise, budget. Yep. You know, I can see how that makes. ROI. Yeah, I can see how that really makes a, a lot of sense or in, intuitively makes sense that there's so many possible directions you can go, right? Um, and so what is the highest priority? And I think what we've seen is a lot of times it, helping to quantify it in a, a structured way can help to illustrate a potential path 
or at least one path to tackle first. So um, again, if you have other uh, comments or context, definitely make use of the chat and we'll make sure to keep that in mind as we go through the webinar. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so why are we here today specifically uh, and what were the objectives of the case study that we did with, with Heavy? Um, so, you know, what we are recognizing is per some of those answers that there, there are challenges in measuring and clearing some of the funding hurdles, right? That there, it's difficult to quantify the value of transforming anything, uh, digital or otherwise. Um, and so what we set out to do, our objective was to take one of our phenomenal customers that leverages this digital manufacturing ecosystem platform that we've created um, and show our other customers uh, and prospects sort of what's the economic impact, uh, build out a model and then really show the economic impact of using fictive right, versus doing things either the traditional way or giving you a means to compare uh, your ROI with, with uh, the current or, or digital transformation initiatives that you have underway, right? And we also want to show you that there's an ecosystem that you can tap into for those same benefits, right? Exactly the same benefits. So we're going to show you piece by piece through this case study um, how, how we uh, qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, how we got those benefits or how heavy got those benefits, right? And without spending all of that money and time on digital transformation. So again, we think there's an alternative. We wanna show you the alternative and we're setting the context up so you can understand how we got to where we are um, and unveil those uh, economic benefits. All right, so uh, in terms of giving you context, I really wanna make sure that you understand what Fictive is, right? And what a digital manufacturing ecosystem really is or a DME. So what Fictive has done is they have leveraged the AWS and I'll, I'll have uh, Preet talk about AWS and, and Nate talk about why we sort of went that way. Um, but it's, it's really an environment where we're taking technology a cloud-based technology with artificial intelligence built in, people, people experts and quality engineers and manufacturing and mechanical engineers and software engineers. So we've got incredible people and their core common attribute is they understand manufacturing. And then we're taking a highly vetted network of 250 manufacturing partners and connecting them all together. So our users, for example, are uh, mechanical engineer users, designers, supply chain managers, can come into an environment through a really cool experience, and we'll share the experience, we'll show you the experience in a bit, we'll give you a demo, can come into the environment, can load up a part or a bomb, can get some guidance through our AI engine or through a human being if they so prefer, right, and give them some design for manufacturing feedback, right, and some guided expertise, right, understand costs and get pricing instantly. And this, just this alone, in most companies that I've seen, getting pricing or quotes takes weeks in some cases, right, especially on the mechanicals. It's difficult. So gives our users instant pricing, and then figures out which is the best partner to get to do this particular piece of work. And through the artificial intelligence engine really figures out who that part, the, the likely partner is. On top of all of this, and this is one of the reasons we went with AWS, was this huge layer of security. Because obviously IP protection is really important to our customers. And so everything is anonymized, everything. Nobody knows that that part is going into a NASA, you know, engine, you know, rocket engine. Nobody knows that a part is going into, um, you know, a heavy robotics uh, system, right? So everything's anonymized. And in fact, we go a step further and we will burst a bomb and put the different parts in different manufacturers' hands 
um, and get them built by different people so that there's even more risk mitigation around IP. So I think this overall platform really speaks to, you know, you know, connecting supply and demand quickly. And then sort of the third part is the, uh, the people and giving them, you know, giving our users guided expertise, but on the back end, giving them quality assurance. We have boots on the ground, quality inspections going on before anything gets shipped back. And as of recently, we are also providing what we call transparency. So our customers can see the manufacturing, the quality and the shipping process through this whole breadcrumb trail. So, so now you have access to a world of manufacturing without all the CapEx involved is the basic idea. That's the fictive digital manufacturing ecosystem. So what I'd like to do is I'd like Preet to talk about, and Nate to talk about kind of the, the AWS relationship um, and you know, Preet, give us some understanding of how powerful your platform is to support something like I just described. Sure. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to highlight some of the uh, you know, uh, points where AWS partnership uh, with the Fictive has been able to uh, bring to uh, the customers. So Fictive is able to innovate faster because uh, they can focus on highly valuable, uh, you know, IT resources on developing application rather than uh, um, you differentiate their business and transform customer experience instead of, uh, you know, undifferentiated heavy lifting. So uh, it, it, it has enabled um, Fictive to deploy globally in minutes. AWS has a concept of a region, which is a physical um, location around the world where we cluster our data centers. And we call each of uh, a group of logical data centers as availability zones. So with uh, using AWS, uh, Fictive can leverage to 76 availability zones across 24 uh, uh, geographic wow. regions worldwide. And uh, it can uh, you know, re um, create a footprint of uh, ecosystem of suppliers and partners uh, it, 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 that can leverage Fictive platform. So Fictive uh, is powered on AWS, which is built, uh, which is a platform built for agility. So AWS let uh, uh, Fictive uh, quickly spin up resources as they need them, deploying um, hundreds or even thousands of servers in minute. So this means uh, they can uh, very quickly develop and roll out new application. And it means that uh, teams can experiment and innovate more quickly and frequently. So if, if the experiment fails, they can always deprovision the resources and start with their new experiment. Uh, another advantage of uh, AWS partnership with Fictive is a cost saving that is passed down to Fictive customers in form of lower cost. So if you look at how people end up moving to cloud, almost always the conversation starter end up being the cost. AWS allows customers to trade the capital expense for the variable expense, meaning that they only pay for the IT resources as they consume it. And uh, the variable expense is much lower than what customer can do uh, from themselves because uh, of AWS economies of scale. Um, and with the fictive, uh, and with AWS fictive can take advantage of uh, elasticity in the cloud. So, uh, you know, uh, it, traditionally customer used to provision uh, over provision to ensure that they have enough capacity to handle the business operation at the peak level. But uh, with effective uh, provision, uh, the amount of resources that are actually needed, knowing that they can scale up or down along with the need of their business and customer, which uh, also reduces the cost and improve effective uh, ability to meet uh, user demands. So uh, Joanne talked about how security. I just want to double down on that and uh, uh, you know talk about how Fictive is uh, able to raise the security posture of their customer data with the uh, by using AWS infrastructure and services. So AWS has been architected to be most flexible and secure cloud computing environment available today. 
our core infrastructure is built to satisfy the security requirements of uh, military, global banks, and other highly sensitive uh, organizations. So AWS uses the same secure hardware and software to build and operate in each of our regions. So all of our customers can benefit uh, from uh, from our platform that has uh, its serving uh, services offerings and associated supply chain vetted uh, and uh, accepted uh, to be secure enough for top secret workloads. So, yeah, I want to just double down on that, Preet, on how sure. important that concept is. You know, a lot of the findings and why we built the platform from the outset was, you know, Dave's experience at Ford and how, you know, some of those mission critical projects were highly sensitive um, for new platforms they were building. So as we thought about partnerships, that was always a critical part and is a, a big reason why we approached building the ecosystem we did. You know, it was a small, highly vetted network, deep integration with those partners, deep relationships, and we send them a strong book of business, which allows us to help standardize their process and, you know, uh, maintain security. So as Joanne mentioned, it's really around the security aspects of you know, uh, NDAs with all of our companies, sanitizing and securing um, their data as much as possible. And, you know, the AWS platform was a critical component of that. So, uh, you know, big portions of that. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more point that, um, you know, working with the customers like uh, partners like Fictive, um, AWS uh, has kind of a, a shared responsibility security model where AWS manages and controls the component from hosting operating system and virtualization layer to the physical security of the facility, while Fictive takes care of the application security, making sure that uh, all the data uh, is encrypted using encrypt various encryption tools and, uh, um, and uh, leveraging uh, uh, you know, the uh, application level security measures. So yep. uh, yeah. Right. And uh, just also want to point out that, um, you know, AWS has gone through a painstaking work, uh, work of getting the uh, compliance certifications like uh, ISO uh, 27017, you know, SOC 1, SOC 2, PCI, uh, FedRAM, which is basically required uh, for uh, uh, government workloads, uh, you know, top secret workloads. So, uh, Fictive is built on using the services that are, uh, you know, certified by these compliance requirements and giving increasing your security posture. So you don't have to worry about uh, those certification uh, in your, uh, you know, data center. You can use Fictive ecosystem and platform, uh, which is pre-certified with those compliance requirements. That's great. Um... Let's, uh, let's move to sort of giving people a little bit of a visual. Uh, on the left side, Christine's showing us sort of a user coming in, looking at the different processes, looking at the different materials, looking at the different um, you know, uh, options in terms of ordering, you know, turnaround time, things like that. And so these are all the inputs that go in, in terms of creating uh, quotes. There's all types of uh, design feedback that might come back on this part. If there's something that's too thin or too tight uh, or not the right material, all of the sort of uh, artificial intelligence are built in to give uh, our users uh, some feedback on, on, uh, on what they're trying to do. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Here's the sort of flow. So really it's you know, very simple uh, 2D, 3D uploads, rapid pricing, uh, our AI engine that really thinks through, okay, who can do this? Who's got the right specialties and right capabilities to, to drive this process? Um, and then on the other end, all of the quality assurance that uh, we put into this both visually through the system, through our transparency capabilities, but also through our people. So Dave, Dave, I are, know oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, you go ahead, you go ahead, Jan, Joanne, I was going to jump to, you know, Dave as the expert Mecky, you know, if, uh, some of the context on, you know, how we work together. I was just going to jump into some of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, no, the, 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 the interface, the platform um, is key. You know, we don't use it 
daily, but we use it daily in kind of a very bursty way, right? We have we have projects where they where they ramp up, they go, and it's important that when things come through, it's 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 um you know it's easy, it's seamless. You know, it's more important now that we're we're working working from home more. But even before that, we traveled a lot, right? So we were often doing this stuff from the road. So um, being able to have things be seamlessly and support remote teams um, are important, kind of regardless of what environment we're in. Um, and in terms of some of the unique stuff uh, uh, where Fictive and Heavy have worked together, uh, I think we'll touch on this later on, but a, a real key thing is being able to uh, match our needs with some pretty niche capabilities in terms of manufacturing, in terms of injection molding, small parts, but we're not a medical device company and can't afford that sort of um, piece. Well, you know, transmissions where we're doing, you know, small custom gears, things where there is manufacturing expertise out there, um, but it's being able to locate that, connect with it, um, you know, have the quality assurance transparency um, and really be able to kind of understand what we're looking for in terms of price, lead time, quality, um, in terms of the needs of our product kind of as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. William had a great question kind of related to that, uh, Dave. You know, he asked, what factors do you consider in the partner matching process? That's a great question, William. I'd say is a big uh, uh, emphasis point for us uh, on the technology and customer experience side. So some of the things that we do and using the AWS platform, you know, we're able to instantly price and we're using a field of technology called computational geometry to actually analyze the geometry of a given mechanical part, simulate its manufacturing method and be able to identify, you know, those unique requirements or features say on a part. So that could be 3D machining. It could be custom gears that re might require EDM. You know, it could be spe even specific tool sets on small end mills that might have deep pockets and, you know, can be really tricky to get a really good surface finish. Um, and, you know, that, you know, cosmetic um, or functional aspect might be critical. So all of that we're doing in 20 to 40 seconds up front on the price. And then that those metadata and tags get passed to our scheduling team that then knows the capability set of our 250 manufacturing partners, their capacity and their historical quality. So those three key items, all those combined allows us to recommend the right shop uh, to then actually produce that work. And that's why, Dave, I don't know, maybe you could touch on gears and some of the work that we've done together there. I know that was a particularly tricky aspect um, for sourcing. What, what, what was your experience um, before and after what were the needs that you needed for those gears specifically? Yeah, so the, the needs that we needed, um, again, were uh, small. So everything we make, you know, is, is relatively small. And, uh, and we have very particular needs in terms of materials because we're, we're, we're kind of taking a known technology of spur gears, really pushing it to its limits. So the materials are important. Um, the tolerances are important. Um, but with kind of some, some tolerances unique to the situation. Um, so there's some tricks we were able to do in, in manufacturing and assembly um, because of the way that we knew that they were compound gears, um, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. before, before Fictive, um, we had gone through a, a range of gear vendors. Um, some just uh, really couldn't hit quality. Some were hitting quality, but with extraordinarily long lead. And we were so, you know, even more than minimum orders, just a long lead was forcing us to carry you know, very high inventory. Um, which is also a, a challenge for, for a company our size. Um, and so, uh, like I said, FICTA, FICTA is important for kind of understanding where you are on the, the cost quality trade-off, right? So if you're making uh, something that's almost disposable, right? That's, that's one thing. It's not good or bad. It's just, it's a choice on someone of the curve. And then if you're making medical devices, right, where someone's life is literally on the line and you know, at least in the United States, price pressures aren't really there. That's, that's a different set of things. You know, heavy mm -hmm. sits somewhere in the middle and it can be a, um, with all the vendors up until now, um, kind of managing it ourselves, that had been a real tricky thing uh, for us to, it has been a real tough nut for us to crack. Um, yeah, and it was so great to be that. able, yeah, I mean, we love uh, the, the deep partnership and enabling like understanding your needs and requirements and still, you know, providing kind of that instant online kind of uh, digital experience, um, you know, that makes us extremely happy. We can help your customers, which I know are also, you know, some pretty big brand names out there and uh, you guys are doing some great work. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. That's great. All right, we're gonna shift to um, kind of the, the economic discussion at this point and uh, really just take a look at kind of what, what we came up with in, in the analysis. 
So we use something called the value cloud from Decision Link. Um, and that really helped us create uh, and build out a model and sort of the business case parameters um, that we applied. But then we took Hebby's data, obviously, and Hebby's company information and put those sort of into our um, benefits uh, um, you know, statements. So overall, what's really exciting is we saw almost $600,000 in total benefits. And for a company the size of Hebby, that's really significant, right? And so um, we saw them in three different areas, and I'm going to let me speak to these, but really we saw uh, risk mitigation, you know, on the supply chain side and support with supply chain management, um, costs and, you know, reducing costs through some efficiencies. And then we saw uplift in sort of revenue generation because we could get things to market faster. And based on that, uh, that affected, you know, top line. So these were kind of the three areas of economic impact and Nate, if you could help me uh, break this down a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll dive in here in a second into the four solutions and some of the math behind it. What I just wanted to you know, share is this is a really exciting, I would say moment for fictive customers like Dave, as well as you know, fictive to help you know, quantify and provide that tangible ROI for our customers, because that's a big piece. I think everyone's struggling with now of how do I talk about, you know, moving or advocating for additional budget, or how do I talk about rationalizing certain projects and programs? So uh, working with decision link, um, each report is custom to each customer. And there's really five key inputs, which creates a really rich dialogue back and forth that allows us to come up with some of these calculations. Um, number of NPI team members, uh, what your 12 month forecast is on sales, your average selling price per unit, um, as well as the volume of the mechanical um, suppliers you're currently using, where we're able to help consolidate and streamline that process. So just wanna give some context there that it really is a back and forth. It's not like you just stick it in a calculator and it comes out. It required you know, that conversation with Dave to understand, okay, what is, uh, what is legitimate, what are some defensible assumptions, and how do these benefit categories align um, to your needs specifically? So um, anything else you'd add, Dave, there as far as like the process and kind of we went together or things that you think customers should think about when they're trying to quantify value? Um, the, the thing that I'll probably keep coming back to is, is kind of being able to make decisions confidently um, and kind of minimizing risk going forward. Um, that's probably, that, that'll, that'll be the thing you kind of hear me circle back through, I think, as we go through each of these areas. Perfect. That's great. Thank so you. So let's that. jump in. Um, let's jump into kind of the next slide on kind of the four solutions. So four key solutions that we identified uh, with Dave and team, you know, the first was really Fictive's bolt-on supply chain offering. The second was a seamless transition to bridge production. The third was on-demand strategic sourcing. So you heard him talk a little bit about holding lots of inventory versus being to do that um, more on-demand and with lower costs. And then the fourth, where there's, you know, we see a lot of value with customers is the rapid sourcing for, you know, accelerating timelines, which obviously gets you to revenue faster. So we're going to step through these um, kind of one by one. We'll show you how our math worked. Um, as well, we know all the engineers out there, you know, want to see the how, not just the what. And that's where I think a lot of the fun uh, comes in. And as I'm just going to read this question here, we also had one uh, on the digital transform. This comes from William again, you know, uh, digital transformation question for Dave and Nate. What do you both think of model based design versus engineering drawings? Do you see it being adopted by engineering teams or manufacturing? What does the future of CAD design to manufacturing look like in your mind? That's a great question, William. Um, let's uh, noodle on that for a second and we'll come back and um, hit that. Okay, great. All right, so in terms of the four solutions that you know Nate really uh, walked through and sort of the problem areas that we were helping heavy with, we kind of wanted to give you the ugly look and the great look, right? In terms of this offering around bolt-on supply chain. So not having sort of a fictive solution means 
you're sending emails back and forth, you're tracking things through Excel spreadsheets, you're, you have a, a, a team of supply chain managers, you know, that's kind of, you know, a thing you have to think about. And, and so there's all this back and forth, there's calls at four o'clock in the morning, maybe overseas to China or what have you. So there is a lot of complexity in managing the supply chain instead of suppliers uh, as you're building uh, these, these, uh, these products. So what we're proposing is obviously the opposite of that, a very streamlined approach with lots of visibility, uh, lots of reporting, and lots of transparency um, and speed. So maybe Dave, you can uh, talk about, you know, your situation and, and this problem specifically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, you know, for us, the, you know, we, we, we kind of had the same, you know, we had this, the, the same network of, of kind of ad hoc things on the left um, with the day of, with the you know, age of uh, shared spreadsheets, at least, like it becomes to be a little bit more manageable, but it's, it's still a mess. Um, for us, the, you know, the key thing is, is that, that third thing over the intelligent partner matching, right? Matching, matching a niche uh, small company with, with, you know, niche expertise and, and really understanding kind of the details, um, you know, around that connection, right? If you, you know, you would say, oh, simple file uploads, okay, quick quotes. Um, you know, those are kind of table stakes for the things like them, but, but fictive, you know, there's a real, uh, you know, human aspect to that, right? But, you know, in the same way that we, I like to think of robotics as tools, like this is a tool, what you're connecting is with people that have an amazing tool at their disposal to make them incredibly effective. Um, so you're getting the best of both worlds of both automation and kind of that, 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 that personal uh, interaction. Exactly. All right, great. Um, so part of, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Uh, Nate. I was going to say some of the, if we flip to the next slide, but go ahead, Joanne, if you had another point. No, uh, I was just going to say, let's, let's show sort of what, yeah. you know, our, um, you know, methodology and thinking about this and how we sort of done, uh, you know, quantified it. If Christine, you want to move to the next slide. Yeah, so part of the build up here, um, what we've seen, you know, in a lot of common instances is Fictive helps um, uh, give leverage to an existing supply chain team at a company. <clears throat> so Dave, I, I know when we were talking, I think at the peak, there was up to, you know, 30 different mechanical suppliers um, the team was uh, working with, is that right? Yeah, across across different projects. Yeah, we have a, a lot of a lot of different suppliers. It's, um, I mean, and that's I've I've heard I we work with customers that are hundreds, right? And when right. you think about some of the bigger companies, like it's not uncommon. That's I think the crazy part is that when you stop to actually consider what is the overhead for all the different, you know, you want the best vendor for the best job, and that's the truth to get the quality that right you're delivering. So and, part and, of and sorry yeah. and, and key for us the you know the, the expensive part of it is is vetting them and onboarding them right so every time we have a new project there's a new kind of class of suppliers that we have to explore mm -hmm. um, and that's that is an expensive and extremely risky part of the process. Yeah, and uh, then hundred percent. Not to mention going to visit them and going to do site visits and inspections and understand you know there's thousands of dollars spent just traveling a group of two or three people to the other side of the world. So there's tons, yeah. of, tons of things involved. So to arrive at this number, a lot of the inputs here are considering, okay, well, how many um, people at heavy and how many hours per week and what's their annual salary? You know, uh, what is the overhead associated with, you know, that group of suppliers that have to get managed? And it's not like, you know, a lot of times it's the hours might seem small, like one to three, you know, every week, but then, the latency between those decisions, like the switching costs of following up and trying to remember and to pester people, it's, it's real overhead that lowers productivity. So as we kind of come to this calculation of some of the weeks and the, you know, we believe the 80% benefit um, of not having that same overhead, which fictive and its team plus technology, you know, um, takes over. That's how we're arriving at this kind of bolt on supply chain solution. So we've seen that to be fairly consistent. Um, but I don't know, Dave, you tell me, you know, how, how has it worked for helping you meet with your, you know, your end customer needs? What's been some of the, the projects or programs where you've seen immediate impact? Uh, you know, the medium, immediate impact is um, being able to essentially confidently incorporate new designs, right, straight into a product and, and have confidence in that quality. So 
um, uh, you know, half, roughly half of, of our business is, is repeat customers, right? So uh, mm-hmm. when, we, when we execute on something the first time, we need to be able to make sure that it's, it's not a one and done sort of thing because that's, that's mm-hmm. what we need um, to, keep, to keep bringing in revenue. Um, and, uh, and just as, as a platform itself, right? It, the, the confidence in that is, um, you know, this, this is why people, people try to bring this in house, right? Cause it's so critical. Like mm-hmm. it seems weird. You're, it's, it's, you're, it's something you're very hesitant to outsource, right? Because what do you do? You outsource things that you don't really care about. Right. So it's, I don't think anybody, anybody's business ever went under because you outsourced payroll to the wrong company. Right. It right. might be annoying if you made a mistake, but it's not, it's not life threatening. Like it would be with supply chain. Yep. That's a great point. Uh, I think we move on to this. Yeah. So in this case, uh, in, in terms of helping you address uh, this challenge, right, which we'll call strategic sourcing for bridge production, it's really that challenge around the risks involved in transitioning from the prototype early stages to sort of the MPI phases, right? And there's costs and risks here um, uh, to get to scale. If you don't have sort of a bridge, a digital bridge or a digital thread of some sort connecting you, because it's just a bunch of stop and starts, right? You could be dealing with three, four, five different suppliers. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really almost very risky uh, going, making this move. So tell us about this part of your world, Dave, and, and kind of some of the benefits that you see uh, being uh, brought forth and some of the risks being mitigated here. Um, yeah, in this, in this case, kind of the specific case was, uh, was uh, working very quickly with kind of the, the new, new class of suppliers for us, which was injection molders. Um, mm. And during that testing phase, there's a, there was a very quick um, back and forth to make sure that we were both understanding the needs of the part. And, and frankly, we were still educating ourselves on what the capabilities of that process, process was. So there was, um, uh, you know, there, there was a straight, there was a lot of kind of iteration in the middle of that. Hap- again, happened very quickly, very seamlessly. Um, that got us going for um, kind of a, a new process that we brought online in our our series actuators. Okay, good. Good point. And then, Nate, if you want to touch on on this one, kind of what we saw from a numbers perspective. Yeah, so I think that the methodology here is really helping to reduce the risk of launch failure. So what we've seen as a common benchmark is you know somewhere around the you know five to ten percent can be a reasonable estimate on help uh, the fictive, you know, digital manufacturing ecosystem helping to reduce that risk. Um, when we think about then, like for each company, a uh, given launch, you know, as far as a marketing budget is also, you know, variable. So that's another key input. I would say customers um, need to consider, you know, what type of launch and what type of product and how splashy is it going to be? Um, and then it's really inputting, okay, well, what type of forecastable revenue is on the line here? you know, what's the, you know, this given build and the average selling price. And that gives us a, a, you know, very tangible way, you know, that's rooted in already existing operational metrics for revenue and cost components to kind of derive this number. So we've seen this, you know, while it might be smaller relative to some others, you know, it is a big um, component for, I can say finance, like a lot of finance people uh, out there um, and CFOs really appreciate risk profiling because it's one of those that you know it's not cost it's you know not revenue but there is you know real risk of you know certain failures so uh coming up with a tangible way and you know a structured way um uh, we've seen it resonate uh, with a lot of companies yeah it's it's a really tough little spot to to uh, to address it's not something that you know, you've got your really large CMs that do sort of mass productions and That's millions right. of things. And, and so it's this nice little, it's this tough little spot, you know, yep. where you're going into maybe a thousand, a hundred thousand of something um, and you're switching, you know, you're switching yep. from one mode of working, you know, kind of in this safe place to, you know, the big bad, we're in production uh, and you're switching vendors. And so to your point, there's risk. And that yeah, launch- is yeah. Yeah. And, ahead, and this yeah. this number is small, just kind of kind of, you know, because of who we are, right? And the kind of niche niche market we're in, um, you know, we sell you know a uh, hundred of something that costs five thousand dollars as opposed to ten thousand of something that costs you know tens of dollars. So you know, I'm sure there are other people watching that you know this this number here would be a vastly different sum 
um, just because they're in kind of a different part of the equation. Well, it might be small, Dave. I, for all the ops leaders out there, you know, I know <laughs> through my my conversations, right, uh, the ops leaders are always getting hammered to pinch pennies and bring down costs, but they never get credits for the risk that they remove, you know, the things that never happen, right? Are we talking about those? So I think this is what we found is a great tool to get credit for all the hard work that the ops leaders and teams are putting in to remove that risk from the business because it is mission critical. So as you're thinking about your own digital, um, you know, uh, uh, approaches and trying to get funding for it, don't leave out the risk part and coming up with a really good structured way to go back to the CFO or go back to your CEO and say, this is the potential exposure we could have if something goes wrong. We need to take account of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So solution number three, um, or challenge area and solution number three. So, you know, on-demand strategic sourcing at scale, right? This is a whole different thing here. So talk to us about these charts and, and what you're seeing here and, and how the, you know, what we're solving here. Dave, I'll, I'll turn oh, to Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. No, that's okay. That's, so the, you know, the, the one on the left, like that's, that is the world of, uh, you know, long lead times and high minimum, minimum order quantities. Right. So it's like, yeah. I want to, I want a gear. Okay. Well, and you can, I can give you one for this price or I can give you, you know, 500 for the same price right? because I got a tool up and I got to do it. Um, and it's going to take six months. Okay. And that's, that's true for, for a lot of components, um, uh, that we deal with, but for a large, large class of them, um, it's all about just being able to smooth out that, smooth out that peak, um, smaller minimum orders, uh, and faster leads, right? Um, so that you can respond because we do, we do see these big jumps, right? Orders for us can be, a customer can be everything from, from one module to, hey, I'm, I'm starting up a, a new class, right? And I need 50 and I need them fast. Um, so that's, it's critical for us to be able to um, go along with that. And it's critical to be able to, uh, uh, know, know that what you're counting on is, is resilient to disruption, right? Um, you know, something that, that is, we're all way more aware of than we were, uh, you know, a year ago. And have you found that uh, helps your customers, right? You have some, you know, time is always precious. I assume for all, a lot of your clients and customers, mm -hmm. you know, they want to start getting data off the machines and testing their mm -hmm. proof of concepts you know, pretty rapidly what's what have they told you as far as like the service you've been able to provide for them and the benefits uh it's 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 critical right um and it's it's critical in terms of us being able to to get them up and running early right you know even if it's, if it's partial shipments knowing that we can follow on with more and that the things we follow on with are going to be exactly the same even though parts may have come from different suppliers under the hood um, and it's also critical that um, for some of our bigger partners, we may essentially be spinning up, you know, new products. Um, you know, the ideas they work on are a, a essentially a new product line that, that goes out to everybody, but it's driven by them. And they're the ones most interested in getting it firsthand. Um, and so our ability to execute on that in, um, you know, a few months as opposed to a year plus is, is absolutely vital. Yeah. So we can jump to the next slide. You know, obviously key to this part is, how much inventory should I hold? Right. Right. That's that critical uh, question. It would be great if people have opinions and your own data points, throw them in the chat or, you know, definitely make use of uh, the group here. Uh, what we're uh, estimating, you know, depending on the product, depending on, you know, the customer base, it can vary widely. In this case, you know, if we penciled in a 15 to 20% you know, of, you know, what your annual revenue is, is a good amount to hold to meet some of those uh, where we're helping to alleviate that cost. And so that comes down to real, uh, you know, dollars that you have to spend against that gross margin. And then, you know, uh, that reduction kind of with leveraging kind of the fictive solution uh, to get to the $24,000. Anything else there, Dave, um, as far as, I'm curious, is it, how do you think about it across all your components, you know, for your full bomb, you know, do you think about, you know, others are obviously probably more difficult to source or some are easier. What has been some of the ways you've thought about, you know, the on time or on demand nature of when you need parts and, you know, what ones are, uh, you know, repeatable in your, in your bomb. 
Um, you know, for for us, and this is this is where where fictive fictive is crucial is um, the 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 design of our actuators have basically been designed to like reuse the same part across actuators. So, so every actuator we make, one of the long lead items, um, uh, you know, the the one that doesn't come from fictive, it's a cross roller bearing. It's a niche bearing, but we use the same bearing in every single actuator we make. So it makes keeping stock on that a little bit less painful. But with the gears in particular, right, that is what makes the actuators different. So there's no way around having that be a unique part for every actuator. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's what drove our focus on kind of this particular part with Fictive for really managing an inventory on this specific part. Cool, that's uh, a great way to think about it. I never uh, grasped that, so thanks for sharing. Thank you. All right. So solution number four, or you know, hitting hitting a, a big challenge is obviously, uh, and the one that's near and dear to my heart from a go-to-market perspective is is accelerating uh, things and accelerating development, uh, and then uh, realizing benefit from a you know get to market faster standpoint. And uh, what are what are some of the um, things we think about here? What are some of the challenges that you had here, Dave? Uh, in, in uh, making sure you hit timelines and uh, maybe even got to market a little faster. Yeah, it's um, uh, this, this I think is, you'll see this, this is the big one for us, right? Getting, getting to market, getting it faster. Um, and again, getting, getting there with, uh, with confidence, right? Knowing, mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, the plans that we set in motion in terms of telling customers, literally lining them up, um, that we can that we can respond to that and and follow through, um, and then the other key part of it is um, keeping keeping the, the team lean right because it's very easy if you don't have kind of the right uh, kind of platform in place you could you know we ourselves even though we're a small company you know a day to confirm here a day to confirm there like that all adds up um, just kind of uh, uh, internally again more so because we're all we're all remote. Um, and so compress, compressing that timeline and a big part of it is um, through visibility and confidence, like basically empowering the engineers that work underneath me, right? So that, so that you know, we, we don't have the time to afford to micromanage, um, you know, uh, to, to, to maintain that confidence, right? We can, we can do that accelerated development. We can empower the people below us and, and mm -hmm. still have confidence in, in the way that things execute further, further through. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Well, we had a big impact here from a financial standpoint Nate, why don't you take us through? Oh, I'm sorry. There was a little piece in here. We wanted to have uh, AWS Preach jump in and and give us uh, give us some of your thoughts on this and compressing timelines and how valuable that could be. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to share um, um, you know uh, some data around uh, what supply chain leaders are up against. So this is a ISM survey across uh, 600 plus global companies and 95% uh, of them acknowledge that, uh, uh, you know, given the current situation that they are at risk. And uh, these risks are spread across uh, demand changes with more than half of them highlighting that uh, their supply chain lead times have been elongated by two times and at least 20%, 21% of them calling out uh, capacity challenges uh, as risk. Uh, but um, close to half of them call out uh, saying that they don't have any good plans in place to be resilient uh, in their supply chain operations. So basically this points to question like what, uh, how can Fictive, uh, you know, build on AWS help you in these uh, 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 situation and, uh, you know, address these concerns. So, so basically there, there are, um, some best practices that, uh, you know, uh, partners like Fictive have been able to adopt to address the supply chain concerns. So for one is, uh, you know, having a real time end-to-end uh, -end visibility, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, um, kind of a, uh, you know, a table stick, uh, you know, so Fictive has uh, access to the data that it uh, collected from its ecosystem of uh, uh, you know, supplier across the globe and, uh, it, you know, it's been able to source uh, rapidly and source at scale. And uh, using that data, uh, you know, you've been able to build uh, um, actionable insight with uh, which helped, uh, you know, dis uh, it's a de decision support platform and do predictive and uh, prescriptive uh, recommendations uh, 
uh, and making it um, the platform more agile and mitigate the risk for its customers. Uh, another thing we are seeing is that uh, use of um, external data sources is very important um, um, uh, in, um, in planning phases. Like uh, it, it can be data from uh, epidemiology or it can be unemployment rates or you know, reopening time. So you know, all of these external data can uh, really help uh, uh, you know, uh, create insight that can uh, streamline your uh, supply chain operation. And um, supply chain teams uh, are typically focused on uh, inventory risk and not worry too much about labor and workforce capacity. But in these situations, we need to make sure that we optimize uh, the operations across both inventory and uh, capacity to get uh, throughput. And uh, we, uh, we see uh, customer talking about how uh, ready, um, you know, about how to be ready for a post-crisis situation and be ready with the uh, operations. But in the beginning of COVID-19, teams are not able to serve the demand. And now they are worried about, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, they might be left with excess inventory. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is where, you know, uh, effective platform really shines and can help a customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I witnessed it myself when we were just coming back from the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. New Year and we realized China wasn't going to come back online after that. You know, I saw the whole fictive team say, okay, we're going to shift gears and through the elegance of the AWS platform and through all the technology, we were able to say, let's point it to India and let's point the platform to the partners in um you know, in Taiwan and in the US, you know, and so all of a sudden there's this agility to move entire workloads to different regions uh, without the customers feeling a thing, right? So that really speaks to, I think, you know, again, the, the, the platform and then the way the, um, you know, the, the applications were designed. Exactly. Yep. And effective being able to make use of, uh, you know, it's a, a supply chain framework that it has built uh, on AWS and be able to address uh, many of the business use cases that we just uh, talked about. Yeah. Yep. So what we're you know super committed and endeavored and really the whole reason why Dave and I started the company is we want to enable product innovators to create. And when we see Dave and other customers leveraging you know uh, the ecosystem we built that just you know gets us really excited and really because it's all around getting time to market and getting revenues. So what we've seen is we've been able to help accelerate development, usually somewhere between 20 to 40% of a given build schedule of a given program or product. And in this case, we're modeling here, you know, around a 30% um, is what we talk, discussed with Dave around helping to cut from 70 weeks, you know, and, and trim 30% off there because of the productivity gains and the sourcing of some of these um, uh, mission critical components but also really validating and testing, like how do you build a better product faster? And that was always the aim and what we've continued to stay committed towards. So with, uh, as you're thinking about your own products and your own programs um, and how do you quantify that, you know, f figuring out like how many, what it's pretty basic. It's, it's amazing that you can get to some really hard numbers really quick. Um, so we're excited to share that, um, you know, how many units, What's your average selling price? How do you think about your, how long your given schedule is and what can be compressed um, by leveraging different solutions out there? And in this case, um, you know, we're netting around uh, 400K um, and getting revenue center. And that, that's real dollars and real bottom line. Exactly. Exactly, that was great. Well, thank you for taking us through each of those sort of uh, solution and, or challenge areas and then the solution and then the benefit because it's, it's nice to talk in qualitative terms, but when you can sit down and really measure everything uh, and show the value, it's great. So um, we're at the end. I think we're actually a few minutes over. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. A special thanks to Dave, our yes. wonderful client for spending his time with us and enlightening us on what you do and, and how you leverage Fictive to get uh, what you do done. Uh, and then Dave and Nate, thank you so much for giving us all of the, uh, the background of the backdrop on the finance side and taking us through the model and the, and the outcome. 
And then Preet, of course, thank you for being our partner and building a great system that we can rely on and scale with and be secure with. So uh, thanks to AWS and to yourself for joining us. You will be getting the um, uh, case study and you will get a copy of this recording if you like after the uh, session. So thanks to all of you for engaging and asking great questions and, uh, and for being our clients. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Yep. And if there's any final questions, I know that uh, we'd be happy to answer any of them. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Mm -hmm. Best of luck with all your builds. Stay safe. Um, so please drop any other questions or uh, in the chat and we'd be happy to answer them. I remember Bye -bye. William asked about drawings. I always make <laughs> drawings. I'm old school. That's the answer to that question. Uh, that's going to be an age old debate. And, but, no, but, and, but, you know, uh, you know um, the truth is it depends, right? I'm an academic yeah. in heart at heart. The answer is it depends. Um, and Fictive understands that, right? Because there are some things where like the drawing is the story of the part and it's the it's the best way to communicate kind of that common information so that everybody understands. Um, for a lot of things, especially in the world of 3D printing, um, yeah, model model based stuff is is totally the way to go. So it depends and Fictive understands that. Awesome. They have to be flexible, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you again.